Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Welcome so much to uh, Books and Books here in the cultural heart of Coral Gables. We really appreciate you being here. While you are silencing your cell phones, if I could just give you a brief look into our Books and Books newsletter. This will give you a rundown of all the wonderful events we have here at Books and Books just about every night of the week. You can pick up a copy of this, of course, when you're buying your copy of your book this evening. Uh, we have events for just about everybody, for every taste. We have Spanish events, we have kids events. We've got something for everybody, as I say. Many of them are now being live streamed through the internet, as you can see by all these lights and cameras throughout the store. And I will tell you very briefly that uh, we do have some uh, cameras pointed at the audience. So for the benefit of those folks that may be watching uh, through the internet all over the world, uh, please make sure you're sitting next to who you're supposed to be sitting next to. <laughs> I encourage you to take a copy of this, or you go online, give us your email address, and that way we can alert you to everything that goes on here at the store. As I say, there's plenty of events. And uh, while you don't uh, you know, have to be here in the store, of course, we'd love to have you here. Uh, you can um, watch online. You can call the number on the uh, screen below. You can order a copy of the book to be signed or you can even call and ask a question of the author as the event is in progress. Uh, but tonight we are very happy to welcome with us Simon Chikoski, the five Dharma types, Vedic wisdom for discovering your purpose and destiny. To give him the formal introduction, I'd ask you to please give a nice round of applause for the Prana Yoga Studios director, Donna Pisa. I was nervous, but you guys just made it so much easier. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a wonderful looking crowd. Um, we are so very excited and honored to partner with Books and Books here in Coral Gables to bring Simon down. It's, uh, it's really an honor, and we there's many, many more events to come with Books and Books, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I know Simon, and I met Simon because my sister Hope worked at the Ayurvedic Institute with Dr. Vasant Lod, who many of you know is the one of the most famous Ayurvedic physicians in the world. Wonderful, amazing, and um, I personally had a reading with Simon recently, and I won't tell you uh, too much about that, but it all came true, like right away. And um, so we're just happy to have him here. Simon, uh, come on up, please. We, um, thank you. Tomorrow at, from 12 to four at Prana Yoga on Malaga, just a few blocks away, we're gonna have a workshop from 12 to four where Simon is going to, uh, there'll be some teachings from the book and he'll actually show you how to do your own chart. So that's gonna be very interesting. So if anyone wants to sign up or needs information, please see me after the event. And we're gonna have space for about 20 readings after tonight. So if you've purchased the book and you'd like to get a reading, please let us know. And if you'd like to schedule something in the future, also please see me and I, I'll be happy to take your name and number and set that up for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, as Donna said, my name is Simon Chokoiski, like chocolate and whiskey, Chokoiski. Um, I teach uh, first and second level Sanskrit as well as medical Jyotisha at the Ayurvedic Institute in Albuquerque, where apparently we don't have much of a dress code, so I have especially next to you beautiful people. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the five dharma types. But before I do, I'd like to define the term dharma. And I'd like to share with you three Vedic insights that our ancient ancestors long ago came up with. Um, the first insight is, and now I don't know how familiar you are with Ayurveda and Vedic wisdom, but uh, today I'm going to keep it fairly, no, I'm getting no. Keep it simple. Okay, good. Um, the first insight is as these sages went into deep meditation, they realized, number one, everyone wants to be happy. Thank you. Thank you. Buy my book. We'll see you. <laughs> the, the second, okay, great. So how do we do that? The second thing they realized is that in order to have durable, long-lasting fulfillment, you need to live with nature rather than against the laws of nature. So, jumping off a cliff might feel good for a little bit. You feel the wind in your face, you feel the exhilaration through your body as you slice through the air, and then <laughs> reality catches up with you, nature catches up with you. So to have fulfillment, to, have, to be happy in the short term, you could pretty much do anything. But for long-term happiness, 
you need to obey the laws of nature. They called this dharma. Dharma means, uh, the word dharma <clears throat> literally means that which sustains the universe. It comes from the Sanskrit root dr, where the word druid comes from, where the word truth comes from, where the word betrothed comes from, to marry. Marriage comes from this word that means eternal. So, anyway, um, so the second rule is follow nature or nature will catch up with you. Then the question arises, okay, great, sounds good, how do we do that? And in order to do that, you have to follow dharma. And dharma, the, the third insight is that dharma has three levels. There is a level of the physical, the body, everything from the skin in. And the ancient sages of India cognize this information under the umbrella of Ayurveda. Ayurveda is that ancient Vedic science that tells you when to eat, how to eat, when to exercise, how to exercise, how to make love, how to pray, how to sleep, everything related that has an effect on your physical well-being. And in tomorrow's seminar, I'll touch on some of the essentials. You don't have to become an Ayurvedic uh, acolyte. You don't have to wear you know, the malas and things to really understand how to live in accord with your physical dharma. But that's not what I'm going to talk about here. A mala is a, is a garland, a rosary. The second level of dharma is the level of everything from the outside of your skin, from the skin out. So this is what job to, to have, what profession, what are you best suited for, how to interact with other people, what is your purpose on this planet. And each one of us has a purpose. In fact, there is a saying in Sanskrit that goes, a mantra maksharam nasti, nasti mula manoshadam, a yogya purusho nasti, yoga kastatra durlabaha. And this is a bunch of fancy speak for, this is the translation, there is no sound that does not have a meaning. There is no plant that does not have medicinal value. And there is no person that does not have a purpose. However, it takes skill to find these things. So the, sage, uh, the sages of ancient India devoted their lives to finding the, uh, the, the value of every sound, and they organized it under uh, the umbrella of the Sanskrit alphabet, the perfect vibrational language. They found the medicinal value of every vegetable, animal, and mineral substance in their environment, and they called this Ayurveda. And finally, they found a way to help people find their purpose, to really understand who you are and live your dharma. And this information came down to us via oral tradition as the five dharma types. So this will be the purpose of my talk today for the next 20 minutes, and then I'll open it up to some questions. Um, any questions so far before I go on? Are you all in the right place? You, if you're not, you can leave now. It's okay. I won't take it personally. Okay. So, the third, so that's the second level of dharma. The third level of dharma is the, everything that is uh, beyond our atmosphere, your relationship to the stars, your relationship to the cosmos, to your creator, creatrix, whatever you want, however you want to term it. It's your spiritual dharma. And your dharma type has a lot to say about the spiritual path you should follow in life. Now, the word should is in, in parentheses because we all have free will, but we all also have a path, and you can choose to abandon that path or follow it, uh, but the sages said you'll get better results if you follow it. So, um, so these are the three levels of dharma, and these dharma types infuse themselves at every level and today, I'd like to just introduce these five types and, uh, and then flesh them out a little bit. So, first, we have the warrior type. Now, any of you who have watched a Disney movie, who've seen a hero flick, know the warrior type. Whether male or female, there's a certain uprightness, there's a certain directness, there's a certain luster in the eye that wants to tell you what to do because that's the natural gift of the warrior. Warriors, the purpose of the warrior type 
is to find a just cause and give their life for it. That just cause might be taking care of their kids. That just cause might be teaching yoga and taking care of the students like a, a, a mother lion. That just cause might be fighting illiteracy in, in your neighborhood. Whatever the just cause is for you, if you're a warrior, I don't care if you're male or female, if you're four foot five or seven foot five, it doesn't matter. You need to anchor yourself to a just cause in your life. Okay? That's the warrior type. The educator, this guy, educators like to do lots of blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So whatever our profession is, whether I'm driving a cab, washing dishes, doesn't matter. I'll drive that cab like an educator. So I'll go around and say, hey, did you know that this building was built in 1947? And the architect, by the way, oh, sorry, I missed the light. But anyway, you should hear this. And the architect, right, we can't help but teach. So some professions are more aligned with that. They allow you to express your gift better. Maybe for you it's driving a cab, maybe it's washing dishes, but typically educators need to share information with others, okay? Next comes the merchant type. Now, contrary to the name, merchants are not all about money. However, they are about the things that make you feel good. Merchants are the happiness brokers of the world. So we have, they're entertainers, they are uh, salespeople who make you feel good. Because you have to feel good when you buy something, right? Oh my God, that dress looks fabulous on you. You look like a star. And here I am, I feel good wearing that dress, presumably. So merchants have the ability to bring comfort, joy, and, and, and sweetness to life, okay? And part of that is that they have to make money so they can share it. And I'll talk about that later, because for the merchant, the number one way out of uh, depression and sadness is charity. In fact, I had one client, she wasn't even a client of mine, she was a friend of a friend who had read the book, and she simply told her, well, you're a merchant, you should do charity. And she was very depressed, she, she was on different therapies and in medicines, and that one suggestion, she hadn't read the book, she started getting involved in a charitable cause. And everything within six months, her life was completely different. She was off medicine. Now, I'm not saying get off the meds. I'm, I'm, that's, that's not, this is an illustration that I heard about later. And uh, folks, this isn't about me, by the way. So I should do a little aside. I, it took me eight years to write this book. And most of it was research and, and looking at charts and, and reading people. But really, this information is not from me. It's not Simon that is, that is speaking. It's really some, some, a tradition that has come down. And I, I just feel blessed to, to share it with you. OK, the next type is the laborer. Now, anybody who takes the test in the book says, oh, God, I don't want to be. Who wants to be a laborer? Well, it's good enough for Oprah. It's good enough for Harrison Ford, for Pavarotti. It's good enough for a lot of people who are essentially community builders. The laborer type is the, 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 the foundation of any solid society because they know how to cohere family. They know how to take care in, uh, uh, of, of kids <coughs> and to take care of the things that need to be taken care of. If I break my leg or if I am sick, I want a laborer to take care of me. I don't want an educator. We educators are finicky. Oh, here, take this medicine, uh-huh. Oh, no, no, please don't breathe on me. No, the labor is in there and they're working. They're, they're in the trenches. And that's what makes them powerful because without laborers, we can't have a society. And Oprah has her book club. She's got, I mean, her audience is like her family, right? She gives and gives. Laborers are the, the wish-fulfilling tree. They're the gift-giving cow. And that's why, by the way, the cow is sacred in India, because it's one of the only animals that will freely share its milk with any other species. And this is the laborer type. They, 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 they know how to give. OK, next we have the warrior, educator, merchant, laborer. Finally, we have the outsider type. 
And like the thumb on your hand, right, four types each have a path. The outsider has to find their own path. So the outsider type is the rebel. They are the rebel with or without a cause, depending on how uh, evolved they are. But the outsider innovates. They find new things. They go outside of their sphere of influence, whether uh, it's their family or their social upbringing or their school, schooling. And to be an outsider means you have to reform the world somehow. You have to bring change in, in, in whatever way it is, even the, the, the most minuscule way. Your job is to change the world. That's it. Okay? So, so you might ask, only five types? But there's seven billion of us. I know you're thinking it. Only five types? Well, think about these two archetypes, male and female. Think for a second if you didn't know, let's say you woke up this morning and you didn't know whether you're a man or a woman. Think about how difficult the daily choices that we make could be, from how to fix your hair, from what to wear, to which restroom to use. Right? All of these are dictated by our gender. And these are just two basic archetypes, male, female. So the Dharma types, though there are only five and there are seven billion people on the planet, still knowing your Dharma type can help you make the day-to-day -day decisions in your life with, with more ease and, and, and comfort without having to think twice. Okay? So, uh, so these are the five Dharma types. Now, the question becomes, great, okay, I've taken the test, I'm a warrior. So what? How does this help me? Well, knowing your Dharma type and knowing whether you're a warrior, laborer, educator, outsider, or merchant means that now you can plug into this ancient wisdom that has been passed down for over 5,000 years where people have tried different things. They've tried different diets. They've tried different uh, uh, relationship styles, different ways of relating. And they found what works for each archetype. So, as you may know, there is always a diet book on the bestseller list. Why is that? Well, number one, because they work. It has to work for it to sell. Otherwise, it would quickly, the word of mouth would go, okay, now this doesn't work. But number two, if one book worked for everybody, it would just be one book, wouldn't it? So every Dharma type has a specific way of eating, has a specific way of exercising, has a specific profession associated with it, um, and, and diet, lifestyle, exercise. Uh, so, uh, sorry, so my point is that once you know your archetype, uh, these, these decisions become easier to make. Now, does anybody here, have you, has any of you taken the test yet that's at the beginning of the book? Anybody know their type? We have one back here. Educator, Educator type. Okay, wonderful. And uh, have you had a chance to read a little bit about it? Uh, just very well. You were hoping I would explain it, right? Yeah. So you don't have to read that's actually not true because educators typically love to read. They love information. So, um, so I'm going to speak to the people who have taken the test. So, educator, and what was, uh, who else raised your hand here? Mine came out two. I got um, two types, yes. yes. I got two types in the first test, and then in the second stage, I got two different types. So, you're very confused right now. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Hopefully, we will dispel that before the end of the night. Okay. Okay, so, um, so now for the educator type, I'm going to go into a little more detail with each type. For the educator type, typically physical things are more difficult. Educators are more finicky. They require a diet that is a little special. Uh, there are certain things they can't eat. Uh, so for educators, vegetarianism is good. Veganism is good. Uh, if you don't want to go that extreme, uh, maybe gluten-free, 
maybe reducing sugar, but there are specific dietary uh, 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 considerations for educators that uh, when a laborer looks at them, think, just eat it. <laughs> eat, eat, the, eat the hot dog. What's wrong with that? Come on. And the educator goes, oh my God, if, if I eat that, I would explode. <laughs> so there is a physical, uh, tends to be a physical sensitivity that accompanies a, a mental, emotional sensitivity as well. Um, spiritually, for educators, meditation and reading are, uh, and, and contemplation are uh, a very good path. You don't have to be out there working in the trenches, uh, 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 suckering to uh, people necessarily, but working as a teacher, as a wisdom giver. What do you do, may I ask? A law firm, okay. Okay. W without without going into depth about what what that is, it that is a, a very suitable profession for an educator type, because an a lawyer is a counselor, and educators in in in, in the pristine sense, right? And educators are the best counselors. They give wisdom to others. Okay. So presumably you're in the right field. Not that I stand here, you know, to, to bear judgment, but like I said, you can drive a cab. I don't care, as long as you're doing your dharma. Okay? Now, one thing about the, the test and the dharma types, like uh, the young woman said, you pick two types. One type is typically your dharma type, your primordial archetype. And the second one will denote your life cycle, the life cycle that you're in. So now this is something that I go into in the book, but if we have five educators, not all of them are, will be the same because some of them will be in different life cycles. For example, you can be an educator in a merchant life cycle. You can be an educator in a warrior life cycle. You can be an educator in a laborer life cycle. And it, it, just like being born in the U.S. makes you American, but if you go to live in Greece, you're experiencing your Americanness through a Greek lens, okay? Uh, and that's yet another way to really hone in on, on what your Dharma type is telling you about yourself right now. If you're an educator in a merchant period, then you have to be promoting yourself and, and selling your knowledge, okay? All right, so any questions so far? Either a completely wrapped or a completely bored audience. I'm going to go <laughs> one question and then two. Yes. Um, I haven't read the book, but can you fall into more than one Dharma type? Be beyond the two that, you know, first Great and question. secondary. Right. So Dharma type is wired in you, just like eye color, gender, I guess, whatever other fixed things there are. So it is my belief that no, you are one dharma type. However, for those people who see themselves in many different types, oh, I've been that, oh yeah, and I've been that, well, then you're an outsider. <laughs> because outsiders can wear many hats. The idea of the outsider is that they are able to blend. So they can walk into the meeting with the boss in full uh, business casual attire, and then that evening they can go to the drum circle and be completely at home. They're, they have the ability to blend, which is why outsiders are the best at foreign languages. They're the best at... Now, other types can speak foreign languages. Pero, ellos hablan así. <laughs> ellos tienen un acento bastante fuerte. Right? They, you retain your own nature, whereas the outsider dives in and they, they become unrecognizable. So outsiders know how to blend, how to merge. The, the, the caution is don't lose yourself in the merging. And there are specific instructions on how to do that in the book, how to not lose yourself. So if, you, if you're one who's seeing herself in many different types, likely you're an outsider. Okay? Uh, one here and then... Um, when I was growing up, I always felt like I was an outsider. Yes. You know, the friends, the cliques, and everything else, yeah. the outsider. But as I grew, I became a warrior in the fact that 
other things that I've done in my life. Um, through the mishap with my sister that was killed back in 1981. Um, that made me more of a kind of a warrior. Yes, you have to step up. Um, but I've also learned that I had to be a laborer through my father's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, my father never showed me, but he basically did what he had to do to sustain the family. And for that, he didn't show me in words, but he showed me in action. And most of that was through me growing up and becoming a man. As soon as I became a man, I noticed that my father was doing things that a man was supposed to do, provide, to do everything he had to do to the family. Um, knowing that his own daughter was killed in 81, um, somehow the warrior was coming inside of me. The laborer started coming. So you're bringing up two very important points. Absolutely. One of the points, and I'll address the, the, your second point first, is that as a species, Fundamentally, all men are warriors, and all women are laborers. Okay, now there are the tomatoes. <laughs> As fundamentally, in societies, for example, where there is war, where there is famine, when there is emergency, men and women tend to revert to these two basic roles. The guy, stomp on the cockroach. I'll protect you, honey. It doesn't matter what your type is. There is a basic male role of a warrior. And there is a basic female role of labor, which is to, yes, take care of the family, to cohere society, and to make sure that some semblance of a family structure is, uh, remains. Understanding exactly what the labor and the warrior's dharma is can help any man, any boy, transitioning into manhood become a man. Because in sacred societies, there were sacred rituals that both men and women had to go through. For women, it's easier. Sorry, but it is. Because as soon as the first menstruation starts, that marks you biologically that your, your entrance into womanhood. Boys don't have that. Boys have to somehow learn how to become men. And in traditional societies, this happened through initiations. Initiations where a young man or a young boy was taken and basically they scared the crap out of him. <laughs> so that in, in a con fairly controlled environment, for example, taking him to a vision quest or, or a labyrinth or any, there are many different forms of this ritual. But the idea is that that boy learns to depend on himself and to stand up for himself and become a warrior. Because at, at the basic biological level, all men have to fulfill their warrior genes before they can flower into becoming whatever their dharma type is. And likewise, all women need to really understand the role of the labor. Now I'm going to get deep. I'm going to dig the hole even deeper now before I get out. Traditional things like cooking, like tending to the home, were always emphasized because, and I'm going to focus on cooking just for a moment, have you ever noticed that the world's greatest lovers, or the, who are supposed to be the greatest lovers, come from the countries that have the best food? <laughs> Italiano. Francese, Spagnolo. Hmm? Have you thought about this? Why is that? Not British. Oh. No, not British. Sorry. <laughs> Stiff upper lip and all. Oh, just boil the potato. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. That's a, um. The idea is because when you cook, you get in touch with your senses. It is a sensual experience. It's, it's touch, it's smell, it's taste. And you learn to become a sensitive person. Now listen, if you're cooking and cleaning all day, whether you're a man or a woman, this isn't for you. But for the modern, especially modern young women who are used to takeout, who are used to the restaurant, who are used to Arby's, 
my contention is that they are losing something very valuable which is the the process of getting in touch with their senses and it's not just cooking and then it's gathering around the table having a conversation interacting with your friends and family that creates a deep bond this is the laborer this is the role of the laborer to create those bonds our limbic systems are responsible for creating those deep bonds if we don't activate them by at least once a week cooking a home meal that you sit around the table turn off the TV even if you have to just stare at each other and <laughs> so what'd you do today yeah. it'll become easier okay and again why these traditional cultures like like France and Spain and India not not to keep it uh, centered in Europe uh, are, are all centered around the hearth of the home and, and cooking is a big part of it. So your point was becoming, stepping up to become a warrior, to become a man, and, and this was required of you because of an emergency. Um, the second point I take away from your question, which I, I really didn't even let you ask the question, but because you know, I'm blah, blah, blah. So the, the second point is that as an outsider, which it sounds like you are, you can, just like the young woman there, you can play any role and as, as, the, uh, as the moment requires it. So you have the most freedom. But freedom for you is also uh, a liability because too much freedom and not, now I don't know what to do. So I, I do talk about three very important steps you need to take that, that can help you find your focus in the book. And again, I know I, I'm plugging the book, but it, it just, there's just not enough, time to, to, not enough time to cover everything. Okay, so we had a question here, and then, yes? No, there are 50 shades of gray. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard, so that, and I haven't read the book. Is there a way to measure how high you are on a dimension, like let's say you are an educator, and does it matter? Does it change over time, over circumstances? Yes, yeah, beautiful and question. Is there a way to gauge where you are? Yeah, are you, are you, you're saying, are you a scumbag, or are you, an, no, how do you know? How high you rank on an educator sure. over time, for example. Let's say that Great initially question. you didn't know yourself and you found yourself, and over time, is there a way to rate and rank yourself to know if you, how high you are and if you're moving in one direction or another? There is a way to know if you're moving. So here is the next little bit of technology, I guess you can say, with the Dharma type. So you know, now you know your Dharma type. Now you know that there's these things called life cycles, but let's even forget them for a second. How do you know how to be the best Dharma type? Every type evolves into another type. So educators evolve into warriors. Oh my God, this just became complicated. <laughs> educators evolve into warriors. Warriors evolve into educators. What does this mean? This means that for educators, we are ideas people. We tend to think, well, I know how the world should work, but we don't do anything about it. Which is why every educator needs to take a little bit of an example from the warrior type. Discipline, action, goal-focused uh, 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 activity, and, and, and actually get in there and walk the walk. For educators, it's sometimes hard to walk the walk. I know, firsthand. You sit on the couch and go, ah, I could do that better than that guy, but I don't do it. Warriors know how to take that step. This goes, that's why exercise is great for educators. So if you're exercising, if you're dynamic, if you're able to convey your ideas to other people, you are evolving as an educator. If, on the other hand, so warriors and educators both evolve into each other. If you're a warrior, you need the opposite. You need to think before you act. Take a second before judging people, because warriors make very quick snap judgments, and they're usually right, but not always. So the best warrior looks like the Aikido Sensei. Oh yes, you're right. You, you will beat me up. Sure, I know, yeah, definitely. They're quiet, they're reserved, but when they need to act, <laughs> three guys fall down. Oh well, I got lucky this time. They're humble. They don't make a show. You know, a lot of our professional athletes could take an example from that. Because it's very hard when you have power, when you have prestige, when you have strength, not to be, what's up? 
right? To still be humble. That's why warriors integrate, they evolve into the educator. They need the educator's humility, wisdom, self-doubt. Woody Allen, educator. <laughs> right? Smart, right? But self-doubting. So warriors and educators integrate. On the other hand, laborers and merchants also integrate into each other. And I talk about this a lot in the book. Very briefly, laborers often are not willing to value themselves. Merchants show them how to do it. Let's say you do lawn work. Oh, I'll do it for 20 bucks. No, say, say your price and stick to it, and people will respect you for it. If you're a laborer, learn to value yourself, and also break out of your shell and learn to have some fun. Um, go out dancing, get a massage, do things that are just for fun. That's for the laborer, because merchants love to have fun. On the other hand, the merchants need to get a little more down to earth. So, they, so each evolves into the other. So that's, that's the answer to your question. That's how you know if you're moving up or down. If you, as a, let's say you're a merchant, if you are building community, if you are following up on your promises, merchants get very excited. Oh, I'll move the world for you, baby. I'll do it. I swear it. And they mean it at the moment but they forget later because they're ruled by emotion which is great which is why we love them they make great comedians and entertainers and salespeople and uh they're, they're fun to be around i wish i were a merchant right now because you know we'd all be having fun drinking wine but i'm not but merchants have to learn to keep it real as well okay so excellent question and there was one back here yes i think you already answered it but can you misuse your dharma? Can you not feel comfortable oh, in yes. your dharma? So the opposite of dharma in Sanskrit is a dharma. <laughs> this is true. Just like in English we have the prefix un, so professional, unprofessional, practical, imp impractical, same thing, it's un. In, in the Sanskrit it's the letter a. So dharma is the laws of nature and living in, in accord with them. Adharma is the opposite. And dharmaha rakshati rakshitaha means dharma protects you when you protect it or when it's protected. Dharma also kills you when you kill it. Means that when you follow adharma, the main person who suffers is yourself. Yeah, you will make people around you unhappy as well. But that goes to a deeper question because today um, we're, we're very big on environmental sustainability, right? But a long time ago, the Vedic sages said that not creating a karmic footprint is more important than not creating a carbon footprint. This means that when you walk in your dharma, you don't create karma. I'll say that again. When you do your dharma, you don't create karma. When you walk against your dharma, which is called? A dharma. A dharma. Good, good. Then you create karma. You create ripples. For example, as part of the research to this book, I spent a year in timeshare sales. Wonderful profession. However, I'm not a merchant type, and it was difficult for me. And there was something about it that I was vibrating at a different level. And people could sense it. And there was a, we were uncomfortable. Please buy this. <laughs> I really need the commission right now. <laughs> and people, <laughs> whereas the person next to me was having fun, they were, and they were selling just like gangbusters. And I, 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 yeah, I couldn't do it. So the question is why I was there for a year, that's another question. So the idea is when you don't follow your dharma, it's like telling a lie. It takes a lot of work to keep up that lie. You have to remember details. You have to remember, oh, who did I tell and what was the story and let me get this person to back me up. It takes a lot of work. And so you create refuse. You, you, this, it's not sustainable. When you do your dharma, it's like telling the truth. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. And it's much easier. So 
the short answer is when you do adharma, yes, it creates havoc in your environment and it ruins you, especially, by creating karma. Okay? Yes? Um, is, are these types also in, in the Vedic astrology in your chart? Do they appear? Yes, so that's part of the research that I did was to find the, your, I can find your type in the Vedic horoscope or at the very least narrow it down to two types. And so tonight, after this talk, I will be, I guess for the first 25 people who, um, who get the book and sort of line up, I'll be giving you a free five minute, very brief Dharma reading. I'll tell you your type and maybe two or three details, like the meaning of life and, and the lottery numbers. <laughs> and, but that's it, nothing else, nothing else, yes. Okay, so how are we on time? Are, uh, we're okay? Couple more questions. Couple more questions. Okay. Um, see, I don't want to answer the question. That's really what it is. <laughs> the difference between Vedic astrology and Western astrology is uh, simply, first of all, they both, they're both systems that work, in my opinion. Astrology is not what you read in the newspaper. That is not a horoscope. Horoscope comes from the root, from the verb root, uh, uh, Sanskrit root, hora, which means hour, and specifically the hour, the minute, the moment you were born. That's a horoscope, uh, a looking scope at the hour. What the horoscope in the newspaper is, is a monthly scope. It's where the sun is for 30 days. So it's not based on you, it's based on a very, very general thing. And it works too, it ha definitely has its uses. Um, so I want to make that distinction. The second distinction between Western and Eastern is the difference between acupuncture and chiropractic. They're both healing traditions. They both work in slightly different ways. Uh, and, and I won't go into the details. Western uses something called the tropical zodiac, which means that March 21st, 22nd, if you're, the, the, the sun is in Aries. Even though if you look at the sky, the sun is not in Aries. The sun is actually still in Pisces relative to the constellations. But in, in Western, it's relative to the season. So March 21st, 22nd, Sun is in Aries. So it, it's a different, different way of using the horoscope. The Vedic says, if it's in the sky, that's where it is. If it's in Pisces, it's in Pisces. Uh, they both work, they both have their strengths and weaknesses, and um, I've seen phenomenal practitioners of both arts. Uh, I happen to favor the Vedic because it, there's a philosophy behind it. There's a 5,000 year tradition of meditation, of Ayurveda, of it really, it, it's in my mind, it's more complete. But as a predictive science, both, both work very well. Okay? Yes? In terms, I guess, also astrology, is there certain types that are, get along better with each other or relationships? Yeah. You look like a laborer and a warrior together. <laughs> <laughs> You're milking me here for that. Yes, so here's the secret. Ty <laughs> types that integrate, that evolve into each other, and what were they? Warrior and educator, and merchant labor, compatible. Types that are the same, also compatible. Educator knows what an... Now, the, the danger there is it might get a little boring. Because you know what the other person is thinking, and after a while you just stop s saying it. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, right. yeah I'll take out the trash, fine. Okay. <laughs> because you're so alike. But like, like with like is still good. Where trouble appears is with the disintegration point. So educator disintegrates into a laborer and vice versa. So still, don't, don't, don't go to the law firm yet to file for divorce. <laughs> All that means is that you speak different languages. Laborers speak from here. Educators speak from here. And you have to learn to meet here. The point being that we each, lab a laborer speaks a different language. Literally, th their, their enteric nervous system is more developed and uh, this is a, an area for further medical research, but um, they literally have gut, better gut feelings about people and things whereas educators tend to be more here. So you have to learn to define your terms and just talk more, communicate more. Warriors and merchants disintegrate. Fundamentally different languages. You say black, 
The, war the warrior says, it's black. Meet me at 5 o'clock. The merchant says, well, I was there at 5.30. Because <laughs> there was a sale. There was, some, there, there, there was a sale at the store. They were having fun. Learn to learn each other's language. So yes, absolutely. That's the basics. Compatibility between evolved types, types that evolve into each other, very good. Same types, also good. Th this disintegration types, challenging. Okay? Yes. What would the Dharma be for someone like Yukteswar? Sri Yukteswar was a teacher. He looks like an educator to me. I don't have his chart, his horoscope. Sri Yukteswar is the guru of Yogananda, the famous yogi who brought much of Vedic and science of self-realization. Probably we have it here. Autobiography of a yogi, we also have it here, if you want to learn about Sri Yukteswar. But I think he was an educator. Yes. What about the family unit? Hey, what about? What about? Yeah, I don't know. What about the family? Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, beautiful question here. I spent a, a fair amount of time in the book talking about persuasion tactics and how to talk to each type. For one type, you want to do the takeaway. Ah, eh, you don't want this. You don't want this thing. Nah, don't, don't even bother. You don't want it. That, but that, t you know, you know the, the takeaway? Ah, eh, no, nah, this isn't for you. You do that with the merchant. Merchants go, wait, but what is it? What is it? <laughs> Whereas you do it with the warrior, they're, all right, fine. And I'll just walk away. And it doesn't work. So with each type, there's a way to talk to each type, uh, each Dharma type. Uh, if you have a warrior child, you have to learn to be an educator to them. Give them wisdom, give them guidance, and don't fight with them. Don't test them. If you're a laborer, there's a different way. So with, with disciplining and dealing with children, um, there are specific strategies. And they basically boil down to what is the strength and weakness of that type and how, how can you take advantage of it? Because you're the parent, right? So you have that, that's your prerogative. But if you're in a family with types that just have difficulty communicating, just understand that. Just like if you know that you're a woman and this person is a man, now you have certain boundaries and certain framework from which to, to, to speak. You're from this country, I'm from this country. Labels sometimes help us to, to create a, a dialogue. But don't use them to, to create misunderstanding. Well, you're just a laborer, you, you don't understand me. Right? It can also be used that way. In, in any type. You're a Scorpio, what do you know? You're American. Pff, stupid American. Right? Labels can be used to disempower as well. So this is ultimately up to you. But this is a powerful tool. And if you use it for good, okay? Once we have time for one more question. One more. One more question. The lotto numbers. Yes. I have a question about doshas. How this interacts with whether you're, I don't know if I'm saying them right, kapha. Yes, vata, pitta, and kapha. Wonderful. Uh, so the doshas, uh, how many of you are familiar with these vata, pitta, kapha, the mind-body types, and Dr. Chopra and, and Dr. Um, Vasant Lad yeah, have uh, popularized? These are yet another way of, of looking at the physical constitution. They're mainly at the physical level of dharma, whereas the dharma type works at all three levels. That's not to say the vata, pitta, kapha aren't useful. They're supremely useful. However, they're mostly restricted to the physical uh, realm. And you can be an educator and be any type. So there is no uh, uh, dependence. If you're a kapha, you have to be this type. No. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, thank you. Yes? Can you tell them what we're going to do in the workshop tomorrow? Yes, absolutely. So tomorrow, uh, we will be doing a workshop in which I will be speaking about the 10 hacks into the physical dharma, including diet, how to eat, when to eat, when to drink. Did you know that if you have water, 15 to 20 minutes, this, this study just came out. You guys, I, should, I need to share this with you, sorry. If you drink eight to 16 ounces of water, 15 to 20 minutes before a meal, 
and just that, nothing else. You stimulate hydrochloric acid in your stomach, and you basically you don't need to take digestive enzymes or anything else. You digest the food that you eat afterwards, as long as you don't drink while and after you're eating, because then you dilute that. A study in England just took, I forget how many obese um, young girls, that's all they did. Have you read the study? That's all they did was drink, use water, and they lost not just weight, but fat. They gained muscle. Their bodies completely changed with no supplements, only water. And it's not how much, it's not even how much you drink, it's when you drink it and how. The same goes for food. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. I'm going to give you the full details of these top 10 Ayurvedic tips on how to handle the Dharma of the physical body. I lost 20 pounds and I sit at a computer all day. I don't exercise. Just doing this. I was like, big guy. No, just 15 minutes. Yeah. And you'll see, you'll get hungry right away. Within 15 minutes, you're starving. That's because the HCL in your stomach is... So I'll talk about that. I will also talk about how to use your own Vedic horoscope to figure out soul purpose, what your hang-ups are, and that kind of stuff. And um, if we have time, then we'll do the lot of numbers. Right? <laughs> so uh, there's a lot more. Uh, I don't want to take up the, the podium here. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, man. Thank you. Folks, I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, favors. First of all, as, so we can get some room in here. If as you rise, you can fold your chairs and lay them across the back. And also speaking as a merchant, the books are for sale behind the counter. The author will be signing them right here. If you're watching online, give us a call. We'll get one signed for you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>